of Fear, where terror is homegrown. Join us as we take a drive down dusty back roads and discover the obscure and dark history of this country, human and otherwise, that lurk in your backyard. Welcome to State of Fear, Episode 5. I'm your host, Chris, and with me, as always, is James. Greetings, folks. All right, so today's episode is going to be on the great, wonderful, sunshine state of California. It is a sunshine state, right? California. That's the sun- golden state, I oh, think. Wait, is okay, what they I think it. Florida is a sunshine state, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been to uh, California, James? Yes, I have. I've been there a couple times. Where have uh, you been to? I've been to San Diego, which is yeah. my favorite part. I've been there three times. Okay. The weather is freaking awesome. Year okay. round, it's like in the. It's like in the eighties, almost here. Oh, it's man. almost Hawaii style weather. I've also heard it's, they have no mosquitoes there. None. That's amazing. I was that on, amazing. you know, went out to the Midway, you know, the, the U.S.'s Midway, went on that yeah. aircraft carrier. Uh, real cool. Uh, the weather, like I said, is gorgeous. It was sunshiny most of the time. Yeah. And like you said, no fucking bugs. That's amazing. It that was so awesome. amazing. Yeah. Now, I've also been to Los Angeles. Okay. Didn't like it. Beverly Hills? Uh, Not Beverly Hills, so to say, but I did go to Hollywood. I did go down to the Walk of Fame, and I would not advise you walk around there down, you know, don't go down there during, you know, when it's dark. Oh, okay. There's some strange characters down there. It's a bad area, uh, huh? Yeah, uh, they don't take very good care of it. The stars are dirty when you're walking the Walk of Fame. It's, oh, wow. it's 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 insulting almost. I got there, and I, you know, I found Christopher Reeve, and I found some of my other favorites, and I was right. like... At least these were clean. Yeah, yeah. Like Christopher Reeve was right out in front of the Kodak Theater where they do American Idol and shit. Okay, so, so it's clean. Yeah. So it was clean. Yeah. But when you get on some of these side streets, some of these great stars, their stars are dingy and wow. covered with crap. I mean, it's it's embarrassing. That's sad. It is. It's very and, sad. Uh, yeah, we, I took my family there, and I said, we're getting out of here. We're not going to be here at dark. I mean, we we did it in the morning on purpose because we left that morning and headed south to San Diego, as a matter of fact, mm-hmm. on our California jaunt. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, we saw what we needed to see and got the fuck out. Have you ever been to Skid Row? No. No, you haven't been to Skid Row. Didn't go to Skid Row. You haven't been to the uh, place made famous by the band Skid Row? No. Sorry, Skid I Row. I said Skid Row. Skid Row. <laughs> No, oh, okay. I have not. My, like I said, that's pretty much it. I, I tapped Northern California for a little while. I think I went when I was in Oregon once. We crossed the border on the highway cruising, uh-huh. but not very long. Just okay. kind of went in there and went the fuck back out. I mean, it was like. Well, that's too bad because you didn't go and pass by the topic of today's episode then. No, I did not. So today's episode uh, in California is going to be all about the Cecil Hotel located in Skid Row, now called the Stay on the Main. Stay on the Main. Stay on the Main is what it's called now. That uh, I mean, when we were researching that and I saw that, I was like, you got to be kidding. Yeah. All this wicked history around this one location. Yeah. There's This place has, I mean, just all kinds of shit. <laughs> Before we get started, why don't we uh, get into your weird news of the day? All right, brother. Today's weird news of the day comes to us also from the great state of California. A coincidence. Just a coinky dink. Coinky dink. Uh, this has happened to us a couple times. We keep doing these. Uh... <laughs> yeah, these uh, uh, synchronicity type things. Yeah, yeah and, without and, even knowing it. You just and it's you just, not intentional. I'm just looking up a story. Strange yeah. Shit. yeah, yeah. It just happens to go. That's that's crazy. Well, anyway, this story is dated. Uh, Friday the 13th. 
Ooh. of December Ooh. of 2019. Like I said, we try to keep the weird news of the day within three months, either, you know, of course, three months past or whatever. Right. I was going to say, either three months before or after. You know, if I can go three months before, I'd be a rich some bitch. We're going to keep it within like a three month time frame. And today, the story is titled. <laughs> this one I couldn't believe when I saw it. Thousands of 10-inch penis fish wash up on California beach. Yeah, when you said you had a story about uh, thousands of dicks on a beach in California, <laughs> I thought maybe it was like a Hollywood thing or something. Like the no. stars were out. Well, I'm going to tell you what, though. There's some weird looking things. Yeah, they are. Technically worms, the garish looking animals were exposed on the sand after a powerful winter storm hit the west coast of the United States, oh, which they're gosh. not used to. That might be what it was, a cold water shift, and it came, you know, forced them out. So it was, a, it was a cold storm, so what we're seeing here in this picture is actually shrinkage? 10,000 <laughs> shrinkage. <ticks. laughs> and the story reads, thousands of 10-inch penis fish have mysteriously washed up on a beach in California following a winter storm. The wriggling animals are a species of marine spoonworm commonly known as the fat innkeeper worm or sometimes the penis fish. I don't know which name is worse. How about dick trout? <laughs> you know, something. I don't understand what the name fat innkeeper worm comes from. I have no idea, but when you look at the picture of one of these things, it's pretty fucked yeah, up. Yeah, it doesn't look like a fat innkeeper, but no, go on. No, it does not. Go on. The critters, I like that, the critters. The critters were spotted, flopped across <laughs> Flop. God. <laughs> Am I going to be able to read this? I Probably not. The critters were spotted, flopped across the sands of Drake's Beach in California, about 50 kilometers, 31 miles north of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. The nightmare scene was first reported by Bay Nature, which wrote that the creatures are quite common along the West Coast in North America. However, because the animals normally live in a U-shaped burrow under the sand, People visiting the beach rarely ever were aware of their existence. Mm, okay. You're walking on all these dicks and don't even don't know. Don't even it. know. Dicks in the ocean, man. Winter storms, which battered Northern California recently, exposed a number of these worms af after the powerful waves washed away several feet of sand. Officially known as Uriquis capo, nice. the animals are perfectly shaped for their lives underground, according to the biologist Ivan Parr, even if they appear hideous to us. They're really not hideous. No, they're they just not hideous. Look, they're just weird looking, but they're not hideous. No. They can live up to twenty five years wow. and that's crazy. That's and a are long even time. and are even eaten as food in countries such as Korea and China. Wow. But they, and that's it, my brother. All right, man. Great story, dude. They, these uh, these fish, I mean, they, they do look like dildos. But, <laughs> that's um, a pretty crazy looking I mean, shit. The, the picture on the news story, uh, it's literally a beach full of these penis things. And uh, I don't know why they call it nightmarish scene yeah, because it, it doesn't look really nightmarish. Not. It's no. really not. No. Un unless you're like a, a, a straight man who has the biggest homophobic fear ever yeah then that'd well, be nightmarish to you but uh no it just it looks interesting i mean this the whole well it's too bad if so many that many were too bad they all died for you know for no reason but yeah know, shit. it also looks like just a dumping ground for like uh the porn industry just all the <laughs> all the used dildos they just get rid of and dump on the beach well it is california <laughs> okay i wouldn't i wouldn't put it past them With that, let's go ahead and get into the topic of today's episode. I can't wait. Yeah, so the Cecil Hotel. All right. In February of 2013, guests staying at the Cecil Hotel in Skid Row in Los Angeles reported their water was a dark color. The hotel sent a maintenance man to fix it. It turns out the problem was a human corpse in the water tank, which had been Yeesh. decomposing for weeks. The body belonged to one Elisa Lamb. Now, that isn't... That's one of the more recent... Um, bodies in the hotel but it's it's not the only one this hotel has a long long and dark history of both murder suicide and and what have you 
I mean, like I said, just because you change the name to I am not booking a room at this hotel. Exactly. Built in 1924, the hotel was designed by hotelier William Banks Hanner as a destination for business travelers and tourists, but within five years of its opening, the U.S. sank into the Great Depression. Although the hotel flourished as a fashionable destination in the 40s, the decades beyond saw the hotel decline as the nearby area known as Skid Row became increasingly populated with transients. As many as 10,000 homeless people lived within a four-mile radius of the hotel. By the 50s, the hotel had gained a reputation as a residence for transients. Now, has a, this hotel has a long and storied history marred by death and despair, and we're going to go through kind of a brief history of those and some of the more infamous and well-known ones um, right now. Yeah. So, in 1947, Elizabeth Short, dubbed by the media as the Black Dahlia, was rumored to have been spotted drinking at the bar in the Cecil in the days before her notorious and to date unsolved murder. Elizabeth Short would be found on January 15th, her naked body severed into two pieces in a vacant lot on the west side of South Norton Avenue, midway between Coliseum Street and West 39th Street in Limert Park, Los Angeles. At the time, the neighborhood was largely undeveloped. Short's severely mutilated body was completely severed at the waist and drained of blood, leaving her skin a pallid white. She was determined to have been dead for around 10 hours prior to the discovery, leaving her time of death either sometime during the evening of January 14th or the early morning hours of January 15th. The body was apparently washed by the killer. Now, her face had been slashed from the corners of her mouth to her ears, creating an effect known as the Glasgow Smile. The Joker. Yeah. She had several cuts on her thigh and breast, where entire portions of flesh had been sliced away as well. So somebody hmm. kept some trophies. You know, that is that is weird. Weird uh, trophies, but they seem like, yeah. Like, I mean, were they sliced or bitten? Were they like, gout? I mean, because I, I don't. I'm I've not, never really read the story of the Black Dahlia. I've heard of it. They were, they were sliced away because they didn't find any teeth marks. Huh. So they were everything that was done to her was done with what they said was the precision of a surgeon. Okay. Yeah, almost a makes very, sense. Almost a callback to Jack the Ripper. Some bit. The lower half of her body was positioned a foot away from the upper, and her intestines had been tucked neatly beneath her buttocks. The corpse had been, quote, posed, end quote, with her hands over her head, her elbows bent at right angles, and her legs spread apart, kind of like doing a jumping jack. Yeah. Just to kind of give you a visual. A total of 750 investigators from the LAPD and other departments worked on the case during its initial stages, including 400 sheriff's deputies and 250 California State Patrol officers, chips, otherwise. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure Ponch was on there. Yep. Over 150 people would be considered suspects, including actor Orson Welles and gangster Bugsy Siegel. But to this day, the murder is classified as an unsolved cold case. Well, you know, back in 47, too, forensics were jack shit. Yeah, they didn't have DNA. They didn't have none of that. No. They didn't have all the traffic cams they have now. Right. They don't have all the technology where they can chase stuff down. And where, and where, he, where she was dropped off was a vacant lot. People didn't really go by there that night. Yeah. You know, I mean, the lady that found her was walking her baby by, but it was during the daytime. Oh, looky here. Yeah, uh, it's a dead, dead woman. There you go. Now, there also have been a number of suicides that have occurred at the hotel. Uh, there have been approximately 11 suicides at the Cecil since its inception. Damn. Yeah. I know. 11? <laughs> yeah, approximately. Jesus. Because there, there are a few that the police are unsure of whether they are suicide or not. So I'm going... Wow. I just pulled a number that of the ones that the police knew for a fact were suicides. Now, some of the more notable ones include July 1934... Former Army Medical Corps Sergeant Louis D. Borden, 53, was found dead in his room at the Cecil. He had slashed his throat with a razor. Borden left several notes, one of which cited poor health as the reason for his suicide. That is probably one of the most brutal suicides. I mean, because slicing your own throat. First of all, it takes enormous guts. Because, you know, yeah. I you mean, know, usually somebody does something like that, they'll hang themselves or do something quick. I mean, po pills, poison, slit their wrists. But... To cut your own throat is, I mean, that is above and beyond a normal suicide. On February 11th, 1962, Julia Frances Moore, 50, jumped from the window of her 8th floor room and landed in a second story interior light well. Moore did not leave a suicide note and among her possessions were a bus ticket from St. Louis, 59 cents in change, and an Illinois bank book showing a balance of $1,800. Second story interior light well? Yeah. She fell six floors. 
Ugh. This next one is weird because it's a suicide with an unintentional murder. Wow. On October 12, 1962, Pauline Oten, 27, jumped from the window of her ninth floor room after an argument with her estranged husband, Dewey. Dewey had left the room prior to Oten's suicide. Oten landed on a pedestrian, George oh, Giannini, 65, killing them both instantly. Oh, my Lord. Now, as there were no witnesses initially, police thought that Oten and Giannini had actually committed suicide together because they were found in the same place. A lover's plunge, I right. guess. However, it was soon determined that Giannini had his hands in his pocket at the time of death and was still wearing his shoes. Now, the police theorized that had he jumped, his shoes would have likely fallen off during the fall or upon impact, and his hands would not have been in his pockets. <laughs> How the fuck would you know? I mean, really? I mean... Your hands in your pockets? Well, maybe not. Yeah, you. you there, there's no way you could really keep your hands in your pocket once you hit that concrete. I guess so, yeah. I mean, she jumped from the ninth floor, so if he jumped from the ninth Natural floor... Natural human reflex, even right. though you're committing suicide, would... you? reach out right, at the last exactly. minute saying never mind i changed my... too late and i'm pretty sure that when they found him she was still on top of him so you don't when you fall together you don't land on top of it another no nah, you yeah, bounce this is not a, a looney tunes cartoon no that is yeah. true yeah so those are some of the more uh notable suicides um our next story is about Pigeon Goldie. Now, in 1964, a retired telephone operator named Pigeon Goldie Osgood, who had been a well-known and well-liked long-term resident at the hotel, was found dead in her room. She had been raped, stabbed, and beaten, and her room ransacked. A man named Jacques B. Ellinger was charged with Osgood's murder, but later cleared. To this day, her death remains unsolved. Okay, see, now that's just... This is just... Man, what yeah. a what a ominous freaking history this, this history, one place has. Yeah, one hotel. One I mean, I know this stuff happens all kinds of places, but man, this is serious concentrated evil right here. And we haven't gotten to like the really notorious ones. So let let's just do that now. Perhaps most infamously, in the nineteen eighties, the hotel was rumored to be the residence of serial killer Richard Ramirez, nicknamed the Night Stalker. Now I did hear about that. Yeah. I remember hearing about this dude on the news. Oh, yeah, he was all over the place. Now he had been a regular presence on Skid Row of Los Angeles, and according to a hotel clerk who claims to have spoken to him, is rumored to have stayed at the Cecil for a few weeks. Ramirez may have engaged in part of his killing spree while staying there. The next serial killer who stayed there, believe it or not, there were more than one, was Jack Unterweger. <laughs> I know. One is bad enough. I would love to see a sign out front of this place. Serial killers welcome. <laughs> Discounter rate per body count. That's right. In 1974, Jack Unterweger, or Unterweger, depending on how you want to say it. Unterweger. Exactly. Murdered 18-year-old German citizen Margaret Schaefer by strangling her with her own bra. <laughs> After he... I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's wrong to laugh, but I could just see it. <laughs> that's a... Ugh. Never mind. In 1976, he was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. Now, while he was in prison, he wrote a bunch of stuff. He wrote a series of short stories, poems, and plays. And at one point, he wrote an autobiography. Now, the autobiography called Purgatory or the Trip to Prison, a Report of a Guilty Man, uh, was written and released in 85. And it was because of that book in 85, a campaign to pardon and release Unterweger, Unterweger from prison began. Uh, many notable writers, artists, and journalists, and politicians uh, agitated for a pardon, including the 2004 Nobel Prize winner. Unterweger was released on May 23, 1990, after re the required minimum of 15 years of his life term. Now, upon his release, his autobiography began to be taught in schools, and his stories for children were performed on the radio. This is a convicted murderer, mind you. Yeah. Okay. Unterweger himself hosted television programs which discussed criminal rehabilitation and he worked as a reporter for the public broadcaster ORF where he reported on stories concerning the very murders for which he was later found guilty. Yeah, this guy's like a local celebrity. Yeah. Later, it was discovered that he had killed eight more women in the first year after his release. What a bastard. All killed the same way with their own bras while doing all this talking while his stories were being read to kids. Uh, this oh lord now uh, this, uh, this this is what's wrong with the justice system and this is a german justice system, and i ain't gonna get off the subject too much but when somebody is this crazy kill them yeah put them to death life in prison why feed them for the rest of, you know for whatever you yeah know? just why? take them out 
because because this, this could happen if they, if they did. Sorry, yes, I support the death penalty. Unterweger then moved to the U.S. in 1990 after he was hired by an Austrian magazine to write about crimes in Los Angeles, California, and the differences between U.S. and European attitudes to prostitution. <laughs> Killing in hoes. That's that's like having an alcoholic go talk about the newest bar that just opened up. I suppose, yeah. Uh, Unterweger met with local police, even going so far as to participate in ride-alongs of the city's red light districts, and it was during that time that he stayed at the infamous Cecil Hotel. Uh-huh. While staying there, he would sneak out at night and proceed to murder three more women before being caught. <sighs> One night after he was caught and convicted in 1994... While inside his prison cell, he hung himself with a rope made from the cord of his tracksuit and the laces of his shoes. Good. The knot he used to hang himself was the same knot that they found on every woman he killed. Well, I'm glad he killed. I hope it, I hope it hurt. He gave himself yeah. a death penalty. Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to continue on with Lisa Lamb, but uh, before we do, the bulk of this part comes from a great article written for AllThat'sInteresting.com by Natasha Ishik. On January 26, 2013, Elisa Lam arrived in L.A. She had just come by Amtrak train from San Diego and was headed to Santa Cruz as part of her solo trip around the West Coast. The trip was supposed to be a getaway from her studies at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, where she was originally from. Her family had been wary of her traveling by herself, but the young student was determined to go out alone. Yeah. You know, kid, college kids do that. They, oh, they, yeah. they backpack across Europe and stuff. Let me do they, it. Yeah, yeah exactly. As a compromise, Lam made sure to check in with her parents every day of the trip to let them know that she was safe. That's why it struck her parents as unusual when they didn't hear from her on January 31st, the day she was scheduled to check out of her L.A. hotel, none other than the Cecil. Of course. Of course. The Lambs eventually contacted the Los Angeles Police Department. The police searched the premises of the Cecil but came up empty. Soon after, police discovered and then subsequently, subsequently released the now infamous surveillance footage taken from the cameras at the Cecil Hotel on their website, hoping that it would generate interest, someone would recognize her. The video in question showed Lisa Lamb in one of its elevators on the date of her disappearance acting rather strangely. In the pixelated footage, Lamb can be seen stepping into the elevator, pushing all the floor buttons. She steps in and out of the elevator, poking her head out sideways towards the hotel's hallways in between. She peers out of the elevator another few times before stepping out of the elevator entirely. The last minutes of the video show Lamb standing by the left side of the door, moving her hands in random gestures. Nobody else was captured on the video except for Lamb. Yes, and I know we both watched this video again during our research, and I'm going to tell you what. That's one crazy-ass video because it makes you wonder, you know... You know, once we get to the end of the story, I'll I'll try to go over a couple of things. Cause yeah, I, I kind of formulated a theory on who might have taken this person out. Okay, okay, interesting. Uh, public reaction to the inexplicable video crossed all the way to Canada and China, where Lamb's family is originally from. On February nineteenth, two weeks after the video was published by authorities, maintenance worker Santiago Lopez found Lamb's body floating in one of the hotel water tanks. He did it. <laughs> Lamb made the discovery after responding to complaints from hotel patrons about low water pressure and a weird taste coming from the tap water. Oh my god. Gross. That would be oh my lord, that you Yeah, yeah. Now according to a statement by the chief of police uh chief of the Los Angeles Fire Department, the tank in which Lamb's body was found had to be drained completely and then cut open from the side to remove her five foot four frame. Also the outside How did it get in there and they had to cut the tank to get her out of it? Also, the top of the tank, which is where the door is, was locked from the outside. Aha. Mm-hmm. Santiago, you guilty motherfucker. He did it. Nobody knows how Lamb's naked corpse ended up in the hotel's water tank or who else might have been involved. That's right. I said naked. Yep. She was found floating lifelessly next to the same clothes she wore in the surveillance video. That's another weird angle. Not only was she put into the water tank or went into the water tank she also was put in there naked or she went in and then undressed herself and then drowned that uh, that no yeah see this whole I'm, thing i'm is going just weird. i'm going for raped and dead the problem with that she is she went in the tank the problem with that is why would the killer put her clothes in the tank with her if he raped get her get rid of the evidence why not take it and burn it 
Well, that that would get rid of it better than in the water a panic. Room. In a panic, sometimes people don't think about that shit. So that that would mean that he raped her on the rooftop, and then just threw everything in there. Yeah, probably after killing her. Okay. See, because that was my theory. Uh, that you know, if you watch the video, mm-hmm. look how long those doors stayed open. No mm-hmm. elevator doors in the world stay open that long, right? Unless she disengaged the elevator when she was pushing all those buttons, which I doubt. Mm-hmm. But then she walked out. So it was like somebody, you know, who she was talking to, you know, maintenance people have keys. And right. They can turn off those elevators but outside. That, they, you know, they got those emergency keys and they can shut off elevators and stuff. Now, do maintenance workers have those or just the fire department have those? I believe probably your maintenance guys do because I'm sure they're trained in at least some kind of elevator maintenance. I mean, I know there's outside contractors and we're going to get off the subject here. I'm going to yeah. keep no, it no, in no, the pocket. No, no, no. That's fine. But that's... these guys have emergency keys probably to every part of the building. The that was just that. a theory I had. That maybe the maintenance guy stopped the elevator, and she was out there wondering what the hell, and well, would he, have all would also have keys to the water tank. Obviously, the guy obviously did. The water tank, yeah, yeah. And maybe he quote unquote discovered her to try to put the blame off of her off of himself. That being said, I would like to see what the outside of the elevators looked like because only all the elevators that I've been in, the only place to put a key in and stop the elevators from the inside. Yeah. Sometimes. I I have never seen one from the outside. Then again, yeah, you would have to go investigate. I'd have to go see you. But then since it's been changed, maybe they changed the outside of the elevators too. And it was an old building. Maybe there was a power switch you could throw. Maybe there was. I mean, the lights didn't go off. The camera didn't go off inside. Nope. But still. But it was very a very trippy video. Mm-hmm. And, all, and it's almost unsettling. But my other response to that is when you see the video... When she gets out, she gets out and goes to the left of the door. Yeah. Now, they didn't see anybody else in that video. If the killer was there, he would have been on the right-hand side. Yeah, I'm going to put this video up. When okay. This ep- when this episode airs, I'm going to definitely put that video up on our social media so people can actually watch the video for themselves. See for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, staff told authorities that Lamb was always seen by herself around the hotel premises. But at least one person did see Lamb soon before her death. At a nearby shop, eerily named the last bookstore, owner Katie Orphan was among the last to see Lamb alive. Hmm. Orphan remembered the college student buying books and music for her family back in Vancouver. She said, quote, It seemed like Lamb had plans to return home, plans to give things to her family members and reconnect with them, end quote. Orphan told CBS LA. When the autopsy results of Lamb's case came out, it only served to ignite more questions. The toxicology report confirmed that Lamb had consumed a number of medical drugs and likely to be the medication for her bipolar disorder, but there was no indication of alcohol or illegal substances in her body. So she was on her medication. Okay. That's important to note because she was bipolar, but she was on her medication. So she wasn't off and going just having an episode. Well, I mean, I don't know. That's what I was going to say because bipolar people, they don't, I don't know if they, they just have personality flips. They're not schizophrenic. They're not, yeah. And, and they don't sit there and talk to themselves. No. They no. just have mood, violent mood swings right. and things of that nature. If okay. I'm correct, I ain't no doctor. But... I'm not either. But that, from what I understand, that it is what yeah. happens. Yeah. Soon after a toxicology report came out, amateur sleuths began pouring over any information they could, they could find in hopes of solving the mystery behind the death of Lamb. For example, one summary of Lamb's toxicology report was posted online by a Reddit sleuth with an obvious interest in medicine. The breakdown pointed out three key observations. One, Lamb took at least one antidepressant that day. Two, Lamb had taken her second antidepressant and mood stabilizer recently, but not that day. And three, Lamb had not taken her antipsychotic recently. Hmm. These conclusions suggested that Lamb, who had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and depression, may not have been taking her medications properly. Okay. So there's that. It is an important finding to note, given that the use of antidepressants to treat bipolar disorder can risk inducing manic side effects if done without caution. Now, some sleuths have understandably latched onto this detail and suggested it was a likely explanation behind Lamb's strange behavior in the elevator. Hotel manager Amy Price's statements in court strongly support this theory. During Lamb's stay at the Cecil Hotel, Price said that Lamb was originally booked in a hostel-style shared room with others. However, complaints of odd behavior from Lamb's roommates forced Lamb to be moved to a private room by herself. 
But even if Lamb had been suffering from mental health issues, how did she end up dead? Furthermore, how did she end up in the hotel's water tank locked inside? Yeah, tell me. I mean, if she was not on her medication, did she attack somebody? Yeah. Maybe the maintenance guy? Who knows? Did she have the strength to go and lift up the door to the water tank? Yeah, no telling. The autopsy did not show any foul play from the evidence that was processed. Of course. But the coroner's office noted that they were unable to do a full examination because they could not examine the blood from Lamb's decomposing body. That's disgusting. Yeah. Yes. Lamb's parents filed a wrongful death suit against the Cecil Hotel several months after their daughter's death was uncovered. The attorney for the Lamb stated that the hotel had a duty to, quote, inspect and seek out hazards in the hotel that presented an unreasonable risk of danger to Lamb and other hotel guests. End quote. The hotel fought back against the suit, filing a motion to dismiss it. The hotel's lawyer argued that the hotel has no reason to think that someone would be able to get into one of the water tanks. And it's a reasonable assumption. Yeah, absolutely. Now, based Especially on, when locked. Right. Especially up on like, the roof. It's like, hello, up on the roof, locked at that. Generally in hotels, roof access is locked anyway. Because they, why would they leave anything unsecured? Right. You know, now, because again, somebody could go up there and dump poison in the freaking water supply and kill everybody in the hotel. This was a hotel in Skid Row, though, so yeah. security might not have been, you know, top priority. Yeah. Uh, or it, maybe it was, but, you know, having so many transients, maybe even some, some drug users, they probably went up there and rigged the door to open. Yeah, well, all so they, know, they can go up on, on the roof and get high, you know? Yep. Based on court documents from the hotel's maintenance staff, the hotel's argument is not entirely far-fetched. Santiago Lopez, who was the first to find Lamb's body, described in detail how much effort he had to exert just to find her body. Lopez said that he took the elevator to the 15th floor of the hotel before walking up the staircase to the roof. Then he had to first turn off the rooftop alarm and climb up the platform where the hotel's four water tanks were located. So the door was not Jimmy to open. Okay, another reason maintenance personnel could have possibly been the culprit. Mm Mm-hmm. Because somebody had to turn the alarm off, if she'd have walked up there, or somebody did, they didn't. What they do? Helicopter drop the bitch. <laughs> Finally, you know, I'm saying sorry. It's just no disrespect, but I'm just saying that, you know, somebody on the inside had to have something to do with this, right? If this if this place was wired to go off, you know, the rooftop alarms. I'm sure they did that in the old days to prevent suicides and stuff. Because back in the depression days and all that crap. They probably had ways to, you know, deter or, you know, detect when people are doing something they shouldn't be doing. Probably. Because, I mean, people, how many people jumped out of the windows already? A bunch. Two or three? Yeah. Yeah. So what's to say, hey, we're not going, you know, they'll just say, hey, we'll just jump out the window. We can't get on the roof. So Yeah, just jump out the window. So somebody had to be able to turn off the alarm, unlock the water tank, and put her ass in it. You'd think they would have uh, suspected Lopez first and, and vetted him out, though. Yeah. I mean, he was on the found the body. What if they didn't find any evidence? And forensics were shit back then. But as you pointed out, she had to have turned off the alarm. So if he has the ability to do that, then and he's the one that found the body, they probably should have. I would. He would have been number one suspect. Exactly. Right off the bat, how did she get up here? How did that? How did she get in the tank? How did the alarm not? Go had off? to get locked behind her. Yep. Uh, finally, he had to climb another ladder to get to the top of the main tank. Only after all this did he notice something unusual. Quote, I noticed the hatch to the main tank was open and looked inside and saw an Asian woman lying face up in the water approximately 12 inches from the top of the tank. Okay, so I take that back. The tank was not locked behind her. It was a wide open. No, it was open. It was open, yeah. I had All the reports I had heard prior has stated that the top of the tank was locked behind her. When she was inside. When she was yeah. inside, but apparently that was not true. Apparently the tank was wide open. So we so we think, anyway. Right. You know, who was up there to know it? You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. Like I was going to say, because now when you look at it now, it's like, this dude looks guilty as hell. According to us. Yeah. You know, and if he's out there still alive and listening to this, somehow, sorry, dude. Lopez said, as he reported to LAist, <laughs> To L.A. is, I guess it's a magazine, whatever. Lopez's testimony suggested that it would have been difficult for Lamb to make it to the top of the water tank on her own, at least not without anyone noticing. The hotel's chief engineer, Pedro Tovar, also made it clear that it would be difficult for anyone to access the rooftop where the hotel water tanks were located without triggering the alarms, which we made no- mention of already. Yep. Only hotel employees would be able to deactivate the alarm properly if, if it was triggered. 
the sound of the alarm would reach the front desk as well as the entire top two floors of the hotel. So he's not the only one that had access to turn off the alarm. All the hotel employees did. Okay. So that means they're all guilty. But who stopped the elevator? Exactly. <laughs> Los I just Angeles, keep going back to that. Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Howard Holm ruled that the death of Elisa Lam was unforeseeable because it happened in an area where guests were not allowed to access, so the lawsuit was dismissed. While an answer to the mystery behind the death of Elisa Lam remains unclear, the obsession surrounding that mystery has remained in the public conscious ever since, and to this day, nobody knows exactly what happened to Elisa Lam. Exactly, and these unsolved things are... I always find them very strange. I always find them scary. You know, it is. And it's yeah. like, because if they got away with it, well, I mean, there are people in this world who probably went their entire lives, got away with something, you know, medieval and, you know, and nobody ever even suspected them. I mean, in this day of, of like, as you mentioned before, cameras everywhere, DNA evidence. Yeah. I mean, people have cell phones and so they're always recording stuff. Um, for somebody to be able to still get away with murder is genuinely frightening. And it's me. also a lot less lot less likely nowadays right. than it was back then. Right. But still, that is a huge mystery. But like I said, but reading the story though, the, most people point out and go, the dude, man, the dude. The right. guy that found her, he did it. I'm sure a ton of people have have uh marked Lopez as the uh suspect. Because I don't know, you know, facts or not, the top of that tank would have been locked. And I would think it would have to be by law to protect the water supply. Right, right. Because you can't. Because who's anybody... who's to prevent some fucker from going up there and putting forty gallons of sulfuric acid in there, and somebody's taking a shower and melts their face off, you right? Know, something like that. Oh yeah, or or even contaminating the tank with some sort of poison. Cyanide. Right. Exactly. Cyanide would kill every one of them within minutes, and they'd have no idea. Right. Exactly. Because you drop dead from that stuff, and they'd wake up the next morning and have. 500 guests in the hotel all dead from drinking the hotel water. Exactly, exactly. You know, so it had to have been secured somehow. So I guess it's just going to have to remain unsolved or else we're going to just concentrate on Miss Lee next time around on California, maybe. I don't know. Because <laughs> there's, there's a lot to talk about there. I'm sure the uh, maintenance guy was questioned probably quite extensively. Probably. I'm sure he was, yeah. yeah well, absolutely. the first thing you want to do when you're, you've are you hidden a body is to... Yell from the rooftop, no pun intended, hey, I found somebody dead in the water tank. I was checking out something because they said there was a foul whatever, and I found this in the water tank. Holy crap, call the cops. You know, that's one of the best things, you know, you know one of those things that criminals probably do back in the old days is like, hey, if we... We we actually call the cops and report the crime. They won't. We won't be the first suspect. Right, right. We can throw them off the trail. You know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the as far as I can tell, there there aren't any actual suspects' names listed as far as the case. So if how I, could it be? There was only the one dude. Well, but all the hotel uh, I guess workers you know. had the ability to turn the alarm off. Either that, or they had alibis. And and who who's to say that a hotel employee didn't steal keys from the maintenance worker to open up the the hotel, the elevator. I don't know. I'm gonna go in and slap somebody. Now, and not, not only doing? that, but again, go back going back to the video. If she went to the left of of the elevator and when she got out, and he was to the right, at some point he would have had to cross the door opening to go, which, follow her. Which is another thing. Cameras. If there was a camera in that elevator, there had to be cameras in the halls. I would think. You would think, but but they don't have that angle. They don't have that angle now. He has access to the recording room. He could have blanked the tape. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't mention that in the story, yeah. but there's things because whoever was pursuing her, or at least seemed to be pursuing her, mm-hmm. was off camera the whole time. Whoever right. she was talking to never came into view of the camera. He he knew where the camera was in the elevator. Yeah. So, he, so he knew to stay. Either there. that or he was just a crazy guest. One of these murdering motherfuckers that keeps coming to this place, knew where everything was, walked around, scoped the place out, figured out how to do it. There's also... The part of the video where when she looks out of the door, she doesn't just look in one direction. She looks in both directions. No, it's directions. creepy, too. She looks like, in both directions. The, the doors are stuck open. It's almost like a horror movie. You know, you're sitting yeah. there and you're getting tense watching this video. And you're like, God, you're just yeah. waiting for somebody to bum rush her mm-hmm. or do something. But the way she, there's nothing happening. She's just And quiet. why wouldn't she, when she got, when she walked out of the elevator, why wouldn't she run? She stood there no and made weird gestures with her hands. Because maybe it was a familiar person. 
you know. But she obviously wasn't comfortable. I get, yeah, something was creeping. She was her. not comfortable, so maybe she, she should have just ran. Maybe it was the fact that the elevator wasn't moving, and maybe she was sticking her head out because she might have heard some noise. There's no telling. I wish there was audio. It'd been cool if there was. Yeah. But. I mean, well, the, the video is so bad that you can't even see like a time or a date on the video because it's all yeah. pixelated out. Yep. Yeah, it, it's not a, it's not a clear. I will see. I guess you, I guess there's no good copies of it. Probably mm. no. There's not. There's the the one they released is is the one you've seen everywhere. Tampered evidence. Yeah. See, I'm sorry. Something something's weird about that, man. I mean, somebody pulled somebody pulled the job. Right. So they had to really think it out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. All right. Well. Um, Man, that's a that's a crazy, crazy hotel. I ain't going. I'm not staying. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't mind going investigating it. I will pitch a tent in the street, but I'm not gonna stay. In I'll there. go stay on Skid Row. I definitely you know? won't stay in, in a in a room near a window or near the now the outside. Ghost hunting this place would That'd be, be badass. That'd be amazing. Yeah, maybe we'll go to that do that one day. You might even get a voice of Richard Ramirez up in there. You never know. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right. Well, until next time, uh, I am Chris. And I'm James. And we'll see you guys in the next State of Fear. You bet. Oh, and don't forget to stay tuned for the personal encounter stories coming up right now. Hi, I'm Christian, and I'm here to tell my ghost story. I'm 19, and I've been a firm believer of the paranormal for quite some time. I live in an apartment complex, and I've never been told of any hauntings or anything scary except that it's apparently in a bad part of town. Last night there was a knock on my door, and I assumed it, w- it was a neighbor, or something like that. So I go to answer, but no one is there. I brush it off as a prank, so I close the door after looking outside. Then I realized I didn't hear any footsteps, and I would've because the stairs up to my apartment vibrate and make very loud noises when stepped upon. Then I hear knocking again, but this time it's quieter and quicker. I go to answer again, and no one is there once again. I start to get angry, yet freaked out about this. I close the door and wait right next to it. Again, something knocked but really hard and loud that I woke up my roommates. I answer quickly again and nothing. No one's there. That's when my roommates ask me what is happening. I tell them the story and they think I'm joking, so they go back to their rooms. As they walk away, I see a very tall man with the most horrific face on my balcony. It has holes where his cheeks should be and his teeth are protruding out of his face. I tell my roommates to rush back to see this, but he's gone already. I go out to my balcony reluctantly, and on the floor where he was standing are teeth that are black like charcoal. I freak out and show my roommates, and they realize I wasn't joking. After some talking, I decide to go to bed about an hour later. I then wake up really early in the morning, I would assume like 3 a.m. or so, and I see the man standing over me. And moments later, he gives this terrifying scream that sounds like he's gurgling saliva and is choking. I had no idea what to do, so I just hid under my blanket, terrified. And when the screaming stopped, I peeked out of my blanket and find nothing. I told my roommates that I was moving out the next morning, and that's the end of my story.